Can you have friends in the drug trade? I don't think it's possible to maintain friendships. Fundamentally, the drug trade is about money. That's all it's about. Welcome to True Crime Unraveled. This is the show in which criminologist Onodora Townsend and me, Yinka Bikini, delve right into the heart of some of the biggest true crime stories. We'll be taking a look at some of the amazing documentaries and dramas that have brought these cases to life. In this episode, we'll be looking at the 2018 murder of Sam Mekaluski, who was killed by his friends when they became jealous of his success as a cannabis dealer. And we'll be discussing 24 hours in police custody, murder in the woods, which follows the investigation into his brutal death and uncovers the dangerous realities of the drug trade. Two police officers came to tell me that Sam's body had been found. I'm thinking it feels like an execution. Many young people get involved in the drugs network without truly understanding what they get themselves into. It's one of those jobs where slowly the truth is starting to come out. They think they're friends and they're going to look after them, but they're not. Ashley White attacked Sam. Jordan murdered Sam. So... It's January 31st, 2018, and the body of 20-year-old Sam Mekaluski is found in a woods by a dog walker in Huntingdon, Cambridgeshire. They'd assaulted him using a baseball bat. They'd also stabbed him in the throat and neck, and overall they'd caused over 20 bodily injuries. It sounds like a frenzied, angry attack. It's particularly violent. Mm -hmm. The victim and the perpetrators were all involved in the drug trade. They're all drug dealers with varying degrees of success. And I think that's really important. Mekaluski was doing very well. He was earning up to £2,000 a week, we find out in the documentary. And it seems like the two perpetrators wanted a slice of that. So this is very much a drug trade, violence fueled attack. So we do have a clip, and here we see the police combine their witness statements to work out why the murder victim may have had enemies and ultimately to see who it was who could have killed him. Yeah, that's me and Sam. And that day, was he carrying anything? His black bag. He looks so young. He's so young. Does he carry anything else with him? Um, he did sometimes carry a strap on him. What, sorry? A gun. A gun? Why did he carry that? Protection, I guess. There was a lot of people who didn't like how well he was doing in his life. It's like a whole different world. Yeah. You know, you're in Sainsbury's and you see a young couple and you're like, oh, that's, that's cute, and you carry on, and the dude's got a gun in his bag, man. It's almost as if he knew that something was going to happen to him, and that's why he tried to arm and prepare himself. Who are our two suspects? OK, so Jordan Shepard, 24, and he actually lived with Sam. They class each other as best friends. Throughout Jordan's life, there are sort of early signs of criminality. This escalated from very sort of petty crimes when he was younger and got more and more serious as he got older as he moved into the drugs world and started becoming more of a key player, I'm assuming? Exactly, yeah. Talk to me about um, Ashley White. Ashley White was 21, also a drug dealer, and had also just been released from prison for GBH. Okay. So this is someone with a significant criminal history. You know, GBH is a, a serious charge. Jordan would rock around saying that he and Sam were best friends, knowing how Sam's story Ends. Can you have friends in the drug trade? I don't think it's possible to maintain friendships because fundamentally the drug trade is about money. That's all it's about. I think it's quite heartbreaking to think that the person who calls themselves your bestie is the person that kills you regardless of the context. Forensics seal off the area and begin to investigate. They find a wallet on the floor, which turned out to be Sam's, and in the undergrowth they find a gun. Another piece of evidence is CCTV footage, which shows Mikuluski and his girlfriend entering a Sainsbury's just a few hours before he's believed to have been murdered. What's key in that as well is that Sam was wearing a black backpack with a brown leather base. The police get a call from Sam's mom because Jordan Shepard has just been over and dropped off all of Sam's belongings, including the black rucksack with that brown leather base yeah. that we saw on CCTV. How did it get there? OK, we know he had it just a few hours before he died, and now his best friend's dropping it off at the house. I think that's maybe one of the dumbest things that I've ever heard, that you're going to drop items from somebody that you've just killed to their mum's house. Why? Why? 
I mean, it makes you question not only their intellect, but also like, was this really thought through? It can't have been. It can't have been. That is not a well planned out crime. How common are drug on drug dealer murders? It's pretty significant, actually. I mean, if we look at some pretty recent stats in the statistical year ending March 2020, there were 695 victims of homicide. 15% of them were known to be drug dealers, suspects of homicides. Around 26% of them were known to be drug dealers. It's huge. Massive. Because of the unregulated marketplace, because this is a trade left solely in the hands of criminals, the marketplace regulates itself, and the best way is through violence. Violence is a deterrent, violence is a threat, and that's what happens in any illegal trade. There are some people who, you know, believe that our laws are there to protect the vulnerable. If we have drugs that are illegal, it will deter them from taking these drugs and putting themselves in danger. From my perspective and my research, a lot of those reasons can be countered, particularly things like safety. You know, I think actually decriminalising at least could lead to better safety. We could regulate chemicals involved, all that kind of thing. Other people might not see that, you know, people that have been personally impacted on loss of a loved one, for instance. So I appreciate that I'm coming at this with, you know, cold hard facts, but I do hope that some of the things that we've talked about at least question some of those things. We have one final clip where we witness the police sort of bring their conclusions together about Shepherds and White's movements and their involvements in this crime. Ashley White is saying that um, Jordan's done it all. Jordan's hit him over the head with a, with a baseball bat and he thought he'd killed him, but then he's got the knife out and stabbed him and Ash White's run away crying and upset and can't believe it's happened. The reality is that they both plan to attack Sam and they're of course both they've done. Yeah, and yeah. it's a joint enterprise thing and now yeah. they're shitting themselves and blaming each other. Basically what we've got now is the two perpetrators turning on each other. Well they're in collusion, they're they're in cahoots, they're partners in crime. Exactly, but at this point in the interrogations, they're still turning on each other and trying to blame each other for being the single person involved. They were charged, they were found guilty. They were sentenced to life imprisonment for murder and their first chance of parole isn't until 2047. There, there isn't amount of money, I don't think, in the world that would make me turn on a loved one. I really struggle to put myself in the circumstances where £2,000 a week is more important and trumps that friendship. The sympathy for the perpetrators in this, for me, is at a minimum. It's at an all-time low. Like, as you see, I close my fingers all together. Like, I, I can't, I can't. No, I feel you. I mean, I, I can't relate at all, but I suppose comparatively, I've been very privileged in my life. Yeah. I've never had to look at the drug trade to be how I'd get my money. To me, it seems insane. It seems like ridiculous behaviour. The documentary does a really good job of exploring all the different elements of this case, all the different angles. And also, I loved seeing this unfold because they managed to find this balance between telling a sad story about someone who's passed, also opening your mind to the sort of broader picture of the debate surrounding violence and drugs. This documentary really highlights one, the lucrative and competitive nature of drug dealing, but also the way it quite literally can tear lives apart. I feel like it was that need to remain top dog that was the motive behind the murder of a, a very real person and a very real friend. In the drugs world, it would seem that survival is more important than friendship. They wanted his trade, they wanted his spot. I mean, they weren't even particularly smart about how they did this crime, you know? Essentially three young men losing their lives in one way or another through death or through long-term life imprisonment for money. If you want to watch the full episode of 24 Hours in Police Custody and Murder in the Woods, you can find it on all four, along with a whole range of other amazing true crime programmes. <laughs>